When you're the lead of a small data team, designing the architecture and picking the tools is one part design and functionality and probably more part budget and making sure you're not overspending on something that you don't need. And this is a concern that I hear comes up a lot with clients and it's a conversation I've had multiple times over the past year. And in particular, it comes up a lot with the database. And so what I wanna do in this video is talk through the way I approach that conversation and give you some ideas, particularly as it relates to, in this case, Snowflake as the database. And hopefully it'll help you come to your own conclusions on whether or not some of these tooling decisions make sense for you. Snowflake in the greater landscape of databases would be considered on the higher end and definitely one of the more expensive options when used to its full potential. And there's a common analogy around using Snowflake that I've heard from multiple different teams, which is they don't want to buy a Ferrari when they really only need a Toyota. And really what they're getting at here is that they don't feel that they should be spending all of this money for some souped up product that's going to be extremely expensive. They're really just trying to do some basic data storage, data transformation. Why overpay in their mind for something like that? And as you think about this from a purely budget perspective, I think that's a reasonable thing to say. Why do you need this whole product over here when you could just pay you know, an annual fee for SQL Server or Postgres or something like that? When you use a tool like Snowflake, and it doesn't have to just be Snowflake, it could be big query, Databricks, a different data ingestion tool, all these different things, I think the concept still applies. You're really only paying for what you are using. So if you're using it responsibly and you have the right configurations in place, then you can actually keep pretty good control over your costs and it won't get too out of hand. I think one of the biggest concerns teams have is the fact that this could just blow up in their face and they have a ton of costs that they didn't need. I'm not saying that's not possible, but when you use some of the tactics that I'll mention later, you can definitely mitigate that a little bit. So with that in mind, back to the car analogy, it's not necessarily like you're buying the entire Ferrari and comparing it to the entire Toyota because when you're using something like Snowflake again, that's pay as you go, you're only using bits and pieces of it as you need. And so it's not like you're fully committing to the entire car, again, in that analogy. As an example, if you're a small data team and you are refreshing your data once or twice a day, you have one or two developers, there's only so much compute activity happening in a given day. So it's not like you have the entire system running 24 seven. When you sign off for the day, on the weekends, overnight, it's not running. But if you don't understand how to set the proper configurations, then yes, it could get really expensive. But the first thing I wanted to mention here is it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one comparison. Now, this is not a blanket statement. Of course, this is why I work with clients one-on-one -on -one and we audit your architecture first to decide if this even makes sense at all. But if you are a smaller team, just because it has the potential to be really expensive doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to blow through your budget. But what you're getting in exchange is a really well done product that you're definitely not going to grow out of that other people can easily pick up and it's just less overhead for you to manage. But what I wanna do now is just talk about some of the example ways that you could potentially limit costs. And I'm gonna focus on Snowflake because it's just the easiest one to talk about here, but a lot of these same concepts can apply to other areas. One of the first levers you can pull here to mitigate your risk is to pick the right size of compute object that you have. So different tools call them different things, but let's just say in Snowflake, for example, you don't need to pick the large or extra large compute warehouse is what they call it. They call it a warehouse. Instead, you could have the small or extra small. And so it may not be as fast, but your cost per minute is going to be less. And so if you're not having a crazy workload, you can just run everything on the extra small. You can develop on the extra small and it'll be more than what you need. I've seen teams that strictly just use extra small and it's really not a big deal. But if you get to the point where it does start to bottleneck, you can always go up. Maybe you set your daily refresh to be a little bit of a bigger warehouse, but your day-to-day -day operations are small or extra small, you're able to keep that under control. Another option you have is to set automatic timeouts. And that means that these compute objects, where again, this is really where you're going to rack up the potential costs. If you set automatic timers to say, after 60 seconds of inactivity or after five minutes of inactivity, go offline, go idle. When they're idle, or they might be called suspended, then you're not actively accruing credits. You're not spending money on it. So again, if you're just one or two people with an extra small warehouse that is going to be suspended after every five minutes of inactivity, there really is only so much compute that you can rack up. Again, you have to be responsible. This is not a blanket statement. I'm just giving you some ideas on how this can potentially not be as crazy as you think. I think the story is different when you're talking about teams with multiple developers, five, 10, 20 developers, operating all day long, multiple ingestion pipelines, a lot of things happening, that is absolutely going to rack up the cost. And I have to imagine those are the type of clients and businesses that these companies really make their money off of. They're not really focused on trying to make a ton of money on small data teams with minimal workloads, but you can still tap in and use that same system of whatever the tool is. The other thing I often recommend is tying this together with database roles. You can make sure only certain compute objects are tied to certain roles and only certain users are tied to the roles. And so it all kind of works together. And so a real life example could be maybe developers can only use extra small. They don't have the ability to use a bigger warehouse, which could accrue higher costs. And so you can limit that. 
or maybe the data ingestion tools have only certain types of tools that they can use and they have certain rules around them. You can really control that. You also have the ability to monitor the costs by individual roles. And so that helps you keep track a little bit more closely on where you are racking up those costs. Maybe you see that the credits being used by the data loader role is getting really high. And so you can look into that, or maybe there's specific developers or specific development roles that are accruing the bigger costs. It just helps you monitor it and stay on top of it. At the end of the day, I'm not saying as a blanket statement that you should always use these tools. It's highly specific. And there are times where it is more expensive and not the right choice for you. But what I do think is important to remember is that if you're able to have a very clear, simple design, you understand what's going on, you understand where this fits in, the pricing structure, your team dynamics, and create this simple flowing end-to-end -end design, you can more easily keep tabs on things like this and allow yourself to use maybe a little bit better tools. And therefore, instead of spending all of your time trying to maintain an on-premise and technically a less expensive tool, and just remember your time has a cost, so there is a hidden cost in all of that, Instead, it may allow you to more confidently move into some of these other tools because you know what's going on. So keeping the architecture simple and seeing the big picture is really important no matter what decision you go with. But hopefully this video helped give you some new ideas on how to approach this conversation because I know it comes up a lot. And especially when you're trying to make that decision from the first time, it's an important one. And if you happen to be in that position and you wanna talk about your current design or maybe get some help on it, I'll leave some information below in the description. I'd be happy to help. Otherwise, thanks as always for watching and I'll see you in the next video.